Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Welcome to String Theory. I am Jonna Hayden. I'm a professional costume designer and clothing uh, historian. I've been doing this for uh, years, about 40. So um, I started very early in life. My mother was trained as a tailor um, and a dressmaker. So I learned early on the construction of clothing and the love of fabric and what it can do. Um, I am, and I'm gonna say this phrase, I've said it in a couple of panels, I am a self-employed costume designer with health insurance and, um, and retirement, of which I have earned myself. So, <laughs> right, <laughs> so that is a phrase you will not hear from 99.5 of the costume designers in, in, in the world. So um, I do this because I love what I do. I am very much like authors. I'm a storyteller. I'm a storyteller with clothing. That's how I tell people about the characters I'm working with. So um, for me, it's very important that the story of the clothing and whatever's, whatever I'm watching, whatever I'm reading, whatever somebody is talking about is believable. It matters. Um, it matters far more to people um, who are reading than you realize. You have audiences that are far more educated than you realize that are out there. I had a friend who was writing Regency romances who was getting nowhere because she did not understand the correct terminology for Regency romances, what the dresses were, how they were built, the correct terminology for what it was. Her books weren't selling because her audience is very knowledgeable about what they do. They, they're reading them for a reason. Also, when you're, when you're creating a world, when you are world building, your world needs verisimilitude. It needs to be believable. And how many of you are building worlds in your writing, right? You're sitting here for a reason, right? Um, nothing makes me crazier than reading about a world that, that doesn't consider all the aspects of what goes into it. Um, very often you'll get a, there's 50 people in the castle in this veiled world where there's nothing but grass and they're all wear, wearing gold lame clothes. I'm like, no they're not, I'm throwing the book across the room because <laughs> that's just not possible. So the reason I start with string theory is because look at what you're wearing. What do you have on? Clothes lame. What do you got on? You're wearing clothes, right? Yes. What are your clothes made of? Cotton, plastic. Whatever. What are you wearing? <laughs> so you've got you've got a, you've got a garment on your body. Okay. It is. Corduroy's baby. Yeah. Mm. Corduroy, fabric of the king. Um. <laughs> right. So, but you have a garment on. Where did you get that? Store. You went to a store and bought it, right? Mm -hmm. Some place had it for you. Where did the store get it? Where they make it. So some other country, some little woman probably sat a machine and sewed it together. Where did the factory get the pieces of fabric? <laughs> right? They got it from a mill that made the fabric. Where did the fabric get the materials? Right? Where did that come from? There's a chain of supply that matters all the way back. Um, just as a matter of chain of supply. Have you noticed how cotton shirts are really thin and not so great right now? There's a reason for that. The cotton crops failed for three years in a row in the Ukraine. So they've been trying, and they've been getting short staple cotton, which is little tiny fibers, not long, because the cotton is not growing correctly. They cannot put that through the regular fabric mills. So they've had to work harder to create fabrics that are less, have less tensile strength and they've had to create the same amount of volume with less product. So now you have these very strange, thin cotton shirts that get holes really quickly that fall apart within a year. And you've noticed that all of the, the people who are selling these things are like, ooh, the cool layered look of the thin things, you know, trying to sell something because the supply chain is broken. The supply chain is broken. So I saw little ahas happen around the room. Because <laughs> so, that's what we're looking for is the aha. When you are creating a world, um, the very first thing most people don't think about is, you know, you need food, clothing, shelter, right? They just go, oh, and they have clothes on. Where did the clothes come from? Where do clothes come from? How did this even start? 
the very first known piece of clothing that existed was a string apron. A string apron that went around the waist and had strings in the front that was, was um, reeds that had been made into um, string by putting it together. The very first sign of that, very first sign of that was found, and the oldest piece of textile that we have in existence is from the caves at Lascaux. Um, and in the caves at Lascaux, yes, there was amazing art, which everybody focuses on. Everybody thinks that's the coolest thing, but for me, that was not the coolest thing. Yes, it shows a certain level of complexity for the society, but the coolest thing for me was the shell with the tallow in it with the wick. And the wick was a double strand um, spun wick. Somebody, it, the level of technology involved in that. So everything comes from string, it all starts there. It all starts there. So the question becomes, when you're creating your world, where do you get your string? String is generally two, well, maybe three things. String is flora, which is um, your reeds, um, any kind of, of, of grasslands, any kind of vines, any kind of, of plant that would create a long tensile fiber. Um, a lot of, you see a lot about linen in the Middle Ages and things, because linen came from essentially teasels, which is something that had to be processed quite a bit. To, you know, somebody had to figure that out, which to me is particularly fascinating. <laughs> linen production is a smelly, messy, nasty thing, but you get an incredibly strong fiber that lasts really well for a long time. Excuse me. Yes. What's linen from? It's well, it's from teasels. If you, it's kind of a yeah, it's a particular kind of teasel, um, and you have to essentially ret, which is rot the fibers in water for a certain amount of time and then pull them out and dry them and then spin them. And if you want to get them white, you have to lay them out in the sun forever, right? So, but it's an incredibly strong fiber and it, it holds up really well. Hemp is a similar one. Um, so you have, you, like I said, you have flora. You can also use different kinds of, of viney type things. So think about your flora. Um, and so there's that. There's, there's flora-based clothing. There is fauna-based clothing, which tends to be the first, because it's skins and furs. And from skins and furs um, becomes rectangular construction. Depending upon the shape of your animal, most animals' skin comes off in a rectangle. <laughs> and from that, some of the earliest pattern drafting was rectangular shapes. How can I use the skin in the most effective way to use the most of it to cover up my body and keep me warm? <laughs> so, uh, so there's there's the fauna part. You also get things like um, internal fibers, um, uh, mm, cat gut, cat gut, sinew, sinew um, different kinds of bone for for tools and things or buttons or, or closures. Very old. Um, those kinds of things. So you think fauna? Those kinds of things can be created from that. Then there's the third, which is insect, which I don't necessarily consider fauna. Um, so if you have really cool insects on your planet, like silk, silk weavers, spiders that have silk-like um, things, that's a third place where your string can come from. And so now in those three things, there's production required. Production has to happen for those three things to become clothing. It matters. Um, the easiest in a lot of ways is, um, is getting a fur, because you can cut off a fur and dry it in the sun and cut a hole in it and put it over your head and there you are, right? If you want more than that, processing the leather requires more technology. It's also smelly, nasty, dirty work. Any, has anyone processed leather? Anyone processed leather in here? Yeah, you know, right? <laughs> it can be like, and to get the high quality, nice leathers, you have to have an industry that can do it, that understands it, that gives you the base and, and the ability. Also, you have to have some place away from your civilization to do that, <laughs> right? Um, so that technology is one that you have to think about how that grows, yes? Why does leather smell so good, but like any acid smells so bad? Um, well, oh, that's, that's a whole other panel. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a lot of discussion there. So in terms of that, there's also um, some of the earlier clothing is, is um, grassland weaving. Uh, a good example is Iceman. How many of you are familiar with Iceman found up in the Alps? Yeah, it, what he was wearing. Have you seen the, the details where they talked about what he had on his body? 
Okay, so, yes. Hmm? There was, I don't have to say that everything, but we have like several different kinds of animals. Yes, we're the same guy. Same guy. It's the one who was found in the in the glacier when they thought it was actually somebody who was, you know, who had just died, and they pulled him out of the ice in the worst way possible. So, oh, the archaeologist in me just has kittens when I think about that. But when they pulled him out, he had, he had leather leggings. Um, he had he had a woven woven grass um, a cape of sort. Um, he also had woven um, grass in his shoes to keep his feet warm and provide insulation. Um, he had. Uh, <laughs> One of the things I found the most fascinating about him is he had a sewing kit. He actually had a sewing kit on his person. And the, so what was fascinating to me is one of his leggings very obviously started to fall apart. And you can see where he did the repair. He did the repair because his stitches are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> They're awful. They're like big, clunky, nasty stitches over stitches. And you can see the person who actually knew how to sew doing the beautiful work on the, on the other seams to make it. It's just like, oh boy, his, his, whoever was doing that was like, oh my god, I can't believe you did that. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's also the um, sandals that are held at the University of Oregon um, that are 40,000 years old that are I've actually seen and held in my hands. Um, they are woven out of grass from prehistoric Oregon. And they're woven, they actually have a nice pretty toe and they have a little ankle thing and they tie and everything. They're, they look like sandals we have today, right? So um, those technologies take time. They take bodies to be on the ground to be able to work with that, to do that. Very often it's women because they're taking care of the children. So whoever you have in your society who is taking care of the children are doing those kinds of things. Doesn't have to necessarily be female, but whoever's taking care of the young are stationary. They are stationary. And stationary is where those things happen. So if you have a nomadic society, you have to think about that, of what they take with them to create those things. Um, so, production. Um, if you are dealing with, you, know, you have to think about your worlds and the levels that they're at. If you are thinking, uh, where are you guys mostly thinking, like fantasy type world? Fantasy worlds? Okay. So a lot of fantasy worlds generally have, um, you have your terrain, right? Um, when, you when you do that, you have to think about, very often you have like your mountains and your valleys and your this and your that, right? So um, the one thing that made me crazy about the, the Gold LeMay dress is that the particular story was set purely in a world that had no, they built their, their castles out of sod, they had no hard metals, they had no, no metal forging whatsoever, um, they, they had nothing like that set up in the story at all, but they were, but they were saying that they had iron door handles, they had Gold LeMay dresses, they had swords, it's like, where does that come from? If you don't have those things on the world, how in the world do you get them? Right? It doesn't work. So also, if you're thinking about this, you have to think in terms of how many people it takes to do this. When you think about string theory and string of just what you have on your body, just what you're wearing, just the string you're on, that's on your person. If you wanted to make a linen tunic, you were looking at five to six hundred hours of spinning enough thread to make that one tunic. One. Five to six hundred hours. That's a lot. That's one person working how long? And if you multiply that by masses of people, you need to have that big of a population. Very often when you're also thinking in terms of clothing, you have to have layers. Because as you get into the more labor intensive or harder to find things like, um, like more difficult things like silk. You have to have somebody who's growing it, somebody who's feeding them all the right things, somebody who's collecting it all up, somebody who knows how to process it, and then somebody who knows how to spin it. The Italians did this very cool thing. They were buying um, silk from China, uh, really heavy, thick silk. They were pulling it all apart and making a thin, lightweight silk out of it. <laughs> Right? So they could triple their money. There's the Italians for you. The Italians, you know, the Florentines, they know what they were up to. Um, they would do that. They would take it apart and get four times the amount from what they were going to and sell it that way. So, I mean, you have to think about what's your, what's your body count involved with that. So do you have the population centers that are big enough to support that kind of technology? Also, you have to think about what kinds of technology and where they are. Obviously, if you're, if you're going to have any kind of metals in your fabric, they have to be able to get it from miners in the mountains, right? 
right? Because we're not creating plastic lame like we are now, where we just get a nice thin strip and they just cut it up and they just put it in there and it's fine. No, lame of the time period was a linen thread wrapped with flattened gold. That's how you got it. And that is some serious work. And it's some serious technology. Um, it can be done without a massive amount of technology, but it takes time. It takes time not only of the buyers, but of the people and developing the skill level to do it. Um, and they generally had guilds that did it. So you can create those. So you have your miners creating that, different th things for that. Then you have your, um, down around forever. The, um, then you have those who are doing the basic stuff, the grasslands, the people who are growing the things that you use, not only to feed your animals, but to use to, to create your, um, your basic threads. Um, and to process them into things that are usable, like linen. Smelly, nasty work generally by swamps. Because you need a lot of water to process that. A so lot it's, of water. There's so many differences. Mm -hmm. I would imagine the cost must have been higher. Not really, because labor didn't really count. Blacksmith labor in the, in the time period, they only, it was only the end item that actually cost anything. Um, unless it was a precious metal, all of the spinning and stuff, this was just labor you did. It didn't, you didn't pay that much. Of course, your world may be different. Um, but the more layers you put into it, like you have, a, you have a, a fine silk and then you add gold to it. The silk itself, just because it's rare, is expensive. The gold adds because it's the gold value on top of it. You know, and then sometimes it's the skill of the people involved in the guilds, not necessarily the lower the ones who are spinning the silk. I mean, that's not where the expense is. So it's, it's the higher ups. Uh, older clothing work in uh, Yeah, a lot more. Um, older clothing generally was made to last for a long time because they wouldn't make it over and over. This kind of stuff, this throwaway clothing we have now, that's throwaway clothing. I went and put my hands on a 500-year-old dress in Pisa, and, and the velvet, it was, oh my god, it was a gorgeous, incredible red velvet dress that's been around for 500 years, and the, the tightness of the weave and, and the tufts of the silk that was the, the, the velvet that was cut was as bright as the day it was made. We do not, automation has caused our fabrics to become weaker and weaker and not as, as um, don't, they don't have the tensile strength that they had then. There's much more attention to pay to that. Because very often you get one or two suits for, you know, one or two sets of clothing for the year, the year, and you would wear linens underneath it because you could throw the linens away. You could wash the linens over and over again, and you protected the outside clothing. Um, it generally, the outside clothing was generally not washed. They would powder it with flour and stuff to pull out smells or grease stains or things like that. They'd use powder or spot clean, but they would not necessarily wash the whole garment. Yeah. And it's kind of an odd thing we don't think about now, right? Yes? Did that make the older clothing heavier? Um, yes, in some ways, and no, in some others. Um, uh, very often, if you had an incredibly light dress, there's a, a dress in Spain that's it's essentially a cloth of gold that's like gauze. It's, like a, it's light and airy. And, and it was a testament to her station that she could afford to have something that was that light and airy. She didn't have to wear it for warmth. She only wore it for beauty. Right? There's a difference. So if you don't have to, that's ostentatious. If you don't have to wear clothing for warmth. <laughs> so and where was that going? That's a really good question. Um, um, other things, wools, animals, um, wool processing. Um, there's generally, especially in England and, and all across the steppes, wool processing is a huge thing. There's usually been one animal that has really amazing, um, some kind of pelt or fur that works really well for processing. It's a great one to throw into your stories, to have people who actually grow these, not only for food, but also for their, their fiber. Um, so, and it can be any kind of animal. It doesn't have to necessarily be a sheep. You know, something with a long staple, and that's a oh, staple. Long fiber, a long fiber animal tends to spin easier than a short one. This is why you can't spin cat fur. Short, short staple. God, I wish I could. Uh, <laughs> oh my God, it's everywhere. Um, <laughs> it's so annoying. But long staple things, um, they tend to, they go together with heat and heat and, and tension. So processing all of that takes time, space, water, minerals, things like that. So where do you do that? You know, so you have your cities doing this, you know, this, um, other things to consider is dye, making your clothing beautiful, different colors. Um, uh, Bruges was the center of dyeing in Europe 
for, for centuries. Very smelly town, very smelly town, but they made incredible colors. But all those different colors take different amounts of things, like um, reds take cochineal or matter. Cochineal is a bug, it's a bug. And to get a good red, you have to have a good mordant, which is a thing that makes it stick. Um, and so, and it's very smelly work. If you want whites, pure whites, you need ammonia or ammonia type things. Um, horse urine is the best. So if you have a lot of horses or pack animals that are moving things, you don't just let the urine go, <laughs> you keep it. So the stables supply urine to the dialogue people, to the, the you see how these changes, things start to happen? But that whole area is incredibly smelly, but it's also, it's an incredibly rich area too. So when you're, when you're putting your towns together, you might think about where do these centers of industry happen? You know, so you've got the mining up here, you've got the, you know, the people who live out in the, in the pasture areas that have the civilizations out there, they have the areas around them where they grow those fibers. Those fibers are not too far away from the groups that are doing the processing, and they're near, they're near the sheep, because the she or the, the animals, that can eat the leftovers from what, when you process the fibers. All of that matters. It all goes together. It's general overview, so it's great. So, there was one more I wanted to know. Yes, you have a question, dear. I was just to say, you, uh, you totally blew my mind on yeah. the conversation you did earlier that, you know, thinking about the medieval diet, diet is very poor in meat. And, you know, peasant food is usually mm -hmm. you know, grains, grains, and maybe you get meat twice a year. And cheese. But John pointed out in a conversation before now that mm -hmm. if you lived in a town with leather processing, all this leather arrives on the hoof and there's all this extra meat. So the, even the peasants in the town, they may not get the fine cuts, but there's a whole lot more meat running around for everyone to eat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, there's food available there. So that's a general overview, and, and that's an awful lot of stuff in a very small space. And I've touched on a lot of different things, but I'm quite willing to answer questions because a lot of people have specific questions just from that. So, questions? Yes? What kind of dye is raw materials? Raw materials. So there's a variety of raw materials. Um, very often it's other plants, um, lichens, um, onion skin, or some kind of, of of um, some kind of vegetable that has a dry a skin that dries on the outside of it. I know skin will give you an incredibly bright yellow, but it's not color fast. So it's one of those colors. Very often you'll see a white thing in a museum that's an extant garment. Um, you'll think it was white, but it really was was yellow to begin with because the yellow fades so quickly. They try to use a mordant, which is a thing that sets the dye. Um, but it, until we got aniline dyes, we didn't really have that. Um, they would use things like alum, coppers. Um, um, people use, well, indigo as a plant, uh, matter as a plant. Uh, lichen comes off of trees, you get neon green off of that. Really screaming neon green out of lichen. It's pretty amazing. Uh, oh yes, that reminds me of the same color. So also, when you're building your worlds, think about your peoples. They come from different areas. We are visual, are we not? We are visual, right? And you're building your, um, your societies, and very often you have a conflict in your story, because if you don't have a conflict, why are you writing the story in the first place, right? Um, we are visual people, so you need to develop the clothing that gives clues to who your groups are. You see armies going, right? When your armies do, you marked with them with your livery. You don't have to do it the same as they did in medieval England, but doing something visually with the clothing that identifies them as that group makes a difference. It gives them more. You don't have to get all the way into heraldry. Like, you know, this, they come from this group that has a lot of onions in there, so they all have yellow. Because like a big batch of yellow guys coming at you is kind of scary, right? Think about um, the blue men of Scotland running around and, and they're you know, painted up all in blue in colors. It's terrifying to see somebody with odd colored skin. It's a visual way of showing dominance over the other group. Um, uh, large vat dyes of, of just making tunics that go over everybody. Very, very common thing that has happened the world over in societies for identifying their tribe. Everybody identifies their tribe in a certain way. Um, whether they put something on their head sticking up or they have particular plates they put on their bodies or something, there is something that matters about that visually as a communication device between groups. 
And if you put that into your story, it helps them, helps your audience define, oh, it's them, oh, it's them. And there's a whole series of color theory about how, what, what colors are more scary than others. You know, the red coat's wearing red because they didn't want to show their blood when they got shot. There's some pride there for you. So, <laughs> right? Other questions? Yes. Just another quick question with that. Would they, yeah. would they use like food crops for that or were those too valuable, like beets or something? Would that well, no, they would use beets that? sometimes. Yes, we're going specifically for that. Beet is, is an interesting thing to use for dye stuff. Um, I'll, if, it's, if there's famine, very obviously they're eating it. Right. You know, um, but they would grow a specific beet for dye because the one that you generally eat is not the same one that you would use for dye. Okay. Yeah, it's a different approach. So, cool. yes. Okay. Oh, there and then there. Yes. And what kind of process um, is, the, is the stuff dyed? Um, usually after it's made into the, the pieces of clothing, the pieces of fabric, and you would do a full dye lot with the, with the whole um, piece into the vat. So you can imagine these are pretty good sized. You know, um, also in terms of, <clears throat> oh yeah, we could go a whole other thing with size of fabrics, but, um, but generally they would just do them at that point and then be far more careful about how they cut them. You know, because they don't, they, when you have somebody, you spin it and weave it, and it's people doing all of it, they don't waste anything. Every little piece of fabric gets used. It has a lot more value. So there was a question up here, yes. Do you have in your brain, what did they make the red out of for red coats? Do you know? What the red they used for that? Oh, oh yeah, I do, actually. Um, they weren't using cochineal. I think they were using matter. Okay. Cochineal is too expensive, but I'm pretty sure it was matter. So. I'd have to look that up just to make sure. Don't hold me to it. Yes. One of the things that you talked about wagon trains, sieges. Yeah. So are there certain kinds of clothing that are easier to eat or better to eat than others if you're like desperate? Excuse me, certain kinds of to eat? Eat? Yeah. Certain kinds of clothing to eat. No, it's more edible. If you have famine, it's if you have famine, people eat everything, including wall paste, given the opportunity. Um, it, well, linen's just like eating hay. I mean, it's not. It's not going to do anything except make you fill up because there's no nutritive value in it at all. Well, it doesn't do anything either except stop you up really well. So <laughs> it's like, uh, it's not fun. But you will eat the animal that makes the wool, you know, and you'll eat the crop. I mean, you can't eat some of the, the dye crops because they're poisonous. Um, but you could definitely, you can, you can eat the, the, the animal that has the thing. You can eat, you can, well, you, can, you won't have any, any padding on your body, so you can make more insulation out of the, the straw to keep you warm because you're thin, but it's, it's not going to feed you very much. So, and there was another question. Yes? Can you use clothing as a defense mechanism? Yes, you can, as a matter of fact. Absolutely. Something that was done in the Middle Ages is, is we wonder very often how they do their armor. Um, there were quite a few um, gambesons made that were multiple layers of linen. And I actually had a friend do a, a test with arrows. He, he did the whole thing where he did a test of arrows with using a, a period bow and um, reproducing um, the, the force factors. And we actually went through a process of spinning and uh, creating linen. And then we um, put together 10 layers of it and did different pound pressures with the arrow to see how far we could get through. And it's remarkably strong. It's very resistant. If the fibers are nice and tight, it works just like Kevlar. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, and a really hard felted wool will do the same thing. Um, a hard, hard felted wool, and if there's different, you know, felt is like heat and, and some kind of water and, and, and um, like a soap of some kind, and you just roll it. The thick, you can make it a very, very dense, dense fibrous thing, and it can be really hard to get a sword through it. So you will see a lot of coats that are not only thick leather, but they'll have thick wool or layers and layers of linen underneath. It works really well. Surprisingly enough. <laughs> oh. Another question for me? Somebody was, yes. So this is good. Um, you know, we have, a, we have a little bit closer to the day where it's a massive supply chain stretching across the planet. Yeah. And then you have the way you did it anciently, which was, you know, everything lived right there in that one town. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. Well, okay, I was assuming for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, at what point did it begin shifting? Was it before industrialization? Was it the rise of urbanism that shifted over to actual, like, large shipping and everything? Oh, no. I mean, if you read about the Silk Road, you had you had the Silk Road going for thousands of years from Antioch from uh, Shanghai to so Antioch. So it wasn't an exception, and that was just a common. It was just a standout. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it's just in terms of supply, people have been trading for a long, long time, yeah. and it was very common for fibers to travel. I mean, oh, we've okay. we have found there's been uh, finds of of English wool in China. 
in, in graves in China. Uh, you know, there's desert graves where they have people who are very clearly from the Ireland Irish areas, dressed in in wool clothing from there that they were trading. So, I mean, it's it's not, you don't have to confine it to um, just this particular continent does this stuff. You can get your dyes from the other continent if you can have shipping that brings it over. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean English wools, Flanders wools, were, wools were sent over to Flanders for processing. I'm getting my terminology wrong. Uh, you can create a trade, trade routes, and very often those trade routes were about those kinds of things. So consider that as an option. Bruges was doing dyeing for fab places that made fabric for centuries, centuries. It was sent from England and France and Italy and all went there to be dyed, and then it went out to the guilds from there afterwards. So, okay. so small scale operation was less common than really. Uh, yeah, as, as they got bigger. You know, I mean, it's just, towns are far more complex at that level than people realize. I mean, people think, seem to think that a medieval society is very small and very contained and nobody talks to each other. That is not how that works. There's a lot of traveling going on between towns and a lot of trade going on. So you can have the people from the mountains coming down and trading their gold so they can get some linen because they don't have anything to wear and taking it back with them. So think about trade routes as well. Yes, both of you guys. So. Uh, I really like what you said soon about our modern situation. Yes. Ukraine, cross family. Cross yes. family happens and then it um, then you've got the chance to change up the political sphere. Because yes. This is now more valuable stuff you're yes. trading. I was thinking plot points. Here. Right, exactly. Um, it's, it's so much more interconnected mm -hmm. than we think. Yes. Do you have a good source that you go to? I don't, I've got to Google. Sorry, <laughs> but for historical terms. Oh, boy. So, I and mean, there's so many, I'm sure. Yes. Favorites. Um, oh, my God. Nothing Victorian. Do not trust a Victorian source for terminology. Um, just, I'll just lay that right out there. The Victorians, oh my god, terrible. Um, I actually collect bad costuming books from the Victorian era <laughs> because they are so bad. I mean, they, they remove entire things because, oh my, the sensibilities. You know, we can't have cod pieces, you know. I was like, really? You know? <laughs> I spent multiple times working backwards through a Victorian costume book to the original portrait, to, you know, working through four or five Victorian books to find the original painting to figure out what the dress really looked like, even though that's a secondary source. You know, terminology in clothing changes nonstop. Uh, one term, coat hardy, one term. That one term has meant easily 15 different things over the span of 200 years. If I say to you, I have a pair of jeans, we all know it's kind of a shape, right? We know it's kind of a thing, but what do they really look like? You know, what do your jeans really look like? We could stand up in this room and get 15 different ideas of what jeans look like. So terminology is very hard. I strongly recommend looking for, like I said, not Victorian. There's a, a couple of costume professors on town. Book, yeah, books, sources, people like me. I'm happy to consult. Um, so when somebody comes to me and says, oh, I want a coat hardy, I say, do you have a picture of what you mean? Because, right, a shirt, just a shirt, has been called six or seven, a coat, C-O-T-E. You know, it's just, I mean, it, it, they, they constantly change from, from society to society. It's like the term cotton. You go to um, Elizabethan England and read about cotton stuffed tights. You think, wow, they went and got a cotton plant and they stuffed it in their you know, tights to make their calves look pretty. It's not cotton. It's not cotton as we know it, cotton. What it is is the short staples left over from wool production that has no other use. It's stuffing. But it is wool-based. It is not plant-based. Different thing altogether. So, yeah, it's like, we're all these things. Okay, so you had a question, and then you next. Yeah, uh, just down to the, the travel question. Yeah. Uh, does that then make things that come from farther away more luxury goods? Or? They can. But not always. Not always. Sometimes it's just you know, the place that has the most wool production is shipping it across to the place that has the most bodies available to, to spin it. Um, and then the people who spin it send it on to the town that has the engineering capability to weave it. They don't do the dyeing. They ship it on to the dyers. The dyers then sell it to, to the guilds that make it into clothing. So, Or the household buys a length of fabric and the woman makes the clothes. And so it's, it's a constant chain of movement, depending upon where the resources are. So there's another question over there. Um, mine has to do with uh, in the modern day. Obviously, we use a lot of uh, petroleum-based oh, yeah. nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, 
and there are you know, people who do not like animal-based products. Mm -hmm. What would happen in the modern day if both of those just disappeared? If both? Both, both animal-based and petroleum-based. Lots of people would be naked. <laughs> <laughs> not always a good thing. Um, well, the petroleum-based one is interesting because those kinds of clothing don't really disappear. I mean, they don't break down well. I mean, there's nothing worse than trying to distress a pair of polyester pants for the stage because it won't happen. <laughs> That's, that, you know, that crease is there for the rest of its natural life, which is not natural. Um, so <laughs> I'm just like, so it ain't going. A lot of people wearing, uh, people wearing petroleum-based things because they don't, like I said, they don't biodegrade the same way. They don't fall apart the same way. Um, sometimes they don't even fall apart at all. Um, and it can be handy for some things, but not for others. And, it, it, and petroleum-based things tend to grab onto odors. So we'd have a very smelly, you know, leisure suit-laden society. That would be so sad. Um, it's like, oh, they were bad enough the first time. You know, the 70s, wrong the first time, don't do it again. So it's just, you know, those of us who lived it. So yeah, mammal-based things, I, when we revert, that's the first thing that we go to for clothing. I don't think that's ever going away. I do find it very interesting that a lot of people who are very much into, let's not do mammal, they, they go to rayon. And does anyone know what rayon actually is? It's a tree. It's a tree fiber. It's a tree fiber that takes an intense amount of chemicals and water and, and, and technology to turn into a fabric. The reason it gets stiff is because it's cellulose. You can't put it through the washing machine in the dryer because it breaks down. That's why you have to dry clean it. But they think that's more responsible and sustainable. Not even, not even close. So, yes. I have an unrelated question. The, no question is unrelated. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, so in the book that I've written, or I have several characters, I guess it's like sort of more of a medieval kind of fantasy, um, that are royalty. Yeah, yeah. And um, I just wondered what kind of tells, like, and they're going to show the, the quality of their clothing. You know, they're rich. They're rich, yeah. yeah. Color is one thing. Whatever is your rarest color to make. Um, and you can define what that is. It's in medieval times, it was purple because development of purple, which is not purple, but actually a true reddish purple. It's not a blue purple, it's a reddish purple. Um, and also had uh, color fast qualities. Also, um, complexity of weave, um, if they had a complexity of design in what they were doing. Um, like I said earlier, lightness, not necessarily having to wear it for warmth. So, because they can afford to heat the castle, whatever it is. Um, also, they can in institute sumptuary laws. Do you know what those are? No. Sumptuary laws are, were very often passed by kings and queens or people in upper society, delineating what levels of society could wear. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, there's lots of information about sumptuary laws. The one about purple, because it was an expensive dye and one guy happened to like it, was um, nobody gets to wear this color but me because I'm in charge and I get to say so. <laughs> Which is pretty much what they are. Sumptuary. Sumptuary laws. S-U-M-P-T-U-A-R-Y. Sumptuary laws. Very important thing. So you can, you can put those in and say this is what these casts can wear. And they, they cannot wear these colors because they're ours. Or this is the color of this house, and if you are not of this house, you don't wear this color. You know, so. I know, right? It's just like, flip top head, dump on the table, have a good time. So, <laughs> so I love doing this, because it's like, oh, we'll think about this. It'll be so much fun. Yes. I have these questions on my school. So yellow was easy to make. Um, in our world, yes. In our world, yes. Yeah. But I seem to remember that the Chinese court, the only the emperor in his area, could wear yellow. Uh huh. How did that come about? You um, I don't that. know that in specific, but I could look it up pretty quickly. Um, it was it had to do with the sun and light and, and okay. things along that line. But there's there is a specific reason for that. I don't have it on the top of my head. This is why I have a research library. Yeah. So. Um, Color fastest. I thought that was interesting. But it was really easy. Yes. Well, easy. Well, yellow comes from a variety of places, but onion skin is a really quick yellow. So, I mean, and there's other ways to get yellow, but that's one that's like, oh, onion skin's broke. There you go. You know, but it doesn't stick. You said something, Ian? I Probably color fastness. Color fastness. Yeah. Yeah. The, the yellow they wore actually lasted. Whatever. Yeah. Else is yellow. Everybody else's yellow didn't last. So, color gold. 
gold thread, you know, if you take a thread and wrap it in gold and make something out of it, ouch, expensive. So silver, not so much, because it, it tarnishes. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to keep maintain a silver anything, so. Yes, Rita, did you have a question? I have a friend who uh, lived in Portland and uh, went out counting sp for spotted owls for Bureau oh. of Land Management. Yeah. She would hike out for days, and she told me that the, one of the first things they told her was, do not wear cotton. They call it killer cotton because she would be out for days and days. She said if, if you got wet, that yeah, you could anymore. freeze to death, you could get hypothermia. Yeah. Can you talk about different yeah. fibers and how they react in yes. extreme cold and protect you and yes. if you're wet? Different fibers. Um, uh, density of fiber is what matters. Cotton is not generally woven in a density of fiber. You can make a cotton coat that's really thick, but it's, the fibers are not tight enough and there's not enough uh, fuzziness on the fiber itself to create a tight connection that doesn't let water or air through. Mm -hmm. um, hemp is a little bit better, linen's a little bit better, wool, hands down. Anything off of an animal where you can create a tight, tight weave and then full it down, that's what they call when they, when they, they take, a, a, like, they weave something that's wool and then they run it through hot water and, and stuff and they full it, which means they make it fuller in its density. Um, and it, it gets incredibly tight. Water can't get through, air can't get through, but if it's still, if it gets wet, it's still warm. It doesn't let warmth through. Um, we have a lot of modern technology, like Gore-Tex does something where it breathes. It's not like plastic that makes you feel like you're wearing a plastic bag and you're running around. It lets air in and out, but it keeps the warm in. Yeah. Interesting fibers that they use for space, space suits. Fascinating stuff. You know, that's a whole different panel. Um, <laughs> it's like, wow, oh, it's so cool. Right, that's a whole different world. Uh, but if you think about it, warmth, it's, it's mostly layers. You know, they usually have the linen layer next to them because they can wash that one. And then whatever the next layer would be might be a thin wool, but a heavy wool over the top. Yeah, and then there's, there's nothing better than rolling up in a big, thick wool blanket, right? So, or a big, thick bare skin, with lots and lots of stuff. Fur on the inside, not on the outside. Yeah. The fur goes on the inside. Most people put the fur on the outside because, wow, it looks cool. Other way around, guys. The warmth is, the in, you know, don't put your, your insulation on the other side. So for paintings, yeah, OK. But for wearing, the fur goes in. So th they would have fur-lined dresses with the fur on the inside for a reason. So. <laughs> Yeah, so I have one minute. One more question? Oh, I'm going to do it. I can do two. We can do two. The of string versus cloth versus full outfit. Yeah. Does that have a range in terms of cost? Um, yeah, just how much you use. I mean, if obviously fabric uses more because it sucks up more. But yeah. I mean, as far as civilization, um, they would. It didn't make sense really to dye the string. Yeah. I you mean, have a lot of ancient cultures with patterns, which they yeah, have yeah. If they had, if they were specifically doing a weaving that they wanted a color pattern, yes, they would dye the string. Um, but that's not where they went first. You know, that comes later. Um, so, but yes, that's the next step, is if you want to create a pattern, then you dye the string, then you weave it into something, then you don't dye it after that. Or you can, if you want to, it be interesting effects. So, yes? I don't have my question, I'll talk to you later. Okay, I'm here. And you know what, we're actually done. I'm glad you guys are fun, thank you. Thank you.